we will call this uh, Bradford Island RAB meeting to order at 5.02 p.m. We'll start, start with a roll call. Um, community co-chair Jordan, I'm here. Uh, Christy Baptiste. Carl Merkel. Here. Kate Murphy. Here. Mitch Patton. Here. Jennifer Riddle. Here. Andrea Summer. I always get that wrong. Summer, uh, and I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure I'll get it wrong. Okay. Uh, uh, moving on to RAD business. Um, first on the list is approval of the March 2024 minutes. So we will entertain motions to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who motion? I did, Jennifer Riddle. Thank you. All right, we have a, a motion to approve and then a second. Any uh, additional discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Okay, next on the list. New member voting. We currently have three outstanding applications. Uh, the application committee, I'm not quite sure, membership committee, what we're calling ourselves, review two of the applications. The third one, the committee has set a time to actually review it after this meeting. Um, so I will open up uh, the floor for nominations to appoint uh, uh, Asa Leckie or Pamela Tweet to the uh, RAB uh, membership. I moved to bring family in. Okay. I second that. That's Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. We have a first and a second to appoint Pam to the RAB membership. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody abstain? Anybody opposed? All right, motion carries. And Pam, who is here in person, can she come join us at the table or do we need to do some kind of official okay. onboarding process? I will entertain the motions to appoint Asa Lecky to the membership. I'll second. I'll make a motion. Is that Andrea? The voice yeah, Senator. sorry, that was Andrea. Okay. okay. Can I second this chair? Yeah. Okay. I will second that motion. All right. Any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Three ayes. And do a roll call vote on that one because I'm not yeah, sure. Let's do it. Let's do a roll call vote. I didn't quite catch who all voted on that one. Um, so myself, uh, Jordan, I, Christy. Oh, she's not here. Carl. Aye. Kate? Aye. Okay. Mitch? You can abstain. Yeah, you're free to abstain. Yeah. Uh, abstain then. Okay. Yep. Okay. Jennifer? I'll abstain as well. Okay. And Andrea? Aye. Okay. That is four votes um, to a point. Do we, now that Pam's on the board, does she get a vote? Have when is she an active member? She a, I mean, she should get a chance to review the Oh, sure. All right, sure. Uh, so that's four votes for, no, none against, and two abstain. Uh, Asa is appointed membership to the RAD board. Okay. 
Uh, and as I stated, we will review the other application, Valerie, at the conclusion of this meeting. Okay. At the meeting to discuss applications, the nomination committee um, had some questions about procedures. Um, so I thought this would be a good time to have it on the agenda, discuss and clarify. I have printed out the questions and the responses from co-chair Megan regarding our concerns. Um, I think the, the biggest one was section 5C uh, pertaining to three consecutive absent meetings. In um, co-chair Megan's response, a typical RAB meets three to six times, or I guess four to six times a year, and so missing three meetings in a row is three quarters of a year. But we're a little odd as we get this going. We are monthly, um, but that isn't really defined. Um, I don't know what the membership thought on changing that procedure to lay out monthly meetings versus quarterly meetings. Um, if I can add to the, the information yes. that I previously provided to the RAB members. Um, so folks are tracking the operating procedures for the RAB were, um, they were written by a contractor we had hired to help us with community involvement. They use their expertise with uh, doing RABs around the country. And their typical experience is they see a RAB every quarter, maybe every two months. So that's kind of the context a lot of these are written with. Um, this is generally just meant to be a guideline for the RAB. It gives us some structure. Um, it gives us some, some tools that we can <clears throat> enforce if we want, or we can choose to not enforce. So for a, a good example is the question of whether being absent is a kind of like three meetings consecutive or three meetings ever. If it was three non-consecutive meetings and a four meeting a year period, obviously that would be a lot. And, and other members may want to try bringing in new folks who would be a little more active. Since we're meeting every one to two months, um, not attending three in a year is quite a bit different. Um, that might just be a normal drumbeat of life. Um, I we, we have had members who have not um, shown up for three consecutive meetings, and in those cases, I just called those folks and asked if they'd still like to attend or not. Um, this provides structure if the RAB members wanted to let a member go due to not attending, um, but we don't have to get to three like consecutive or non-consecutive meetings and say, okay, you got to get out of here. The operating procedures say so. We have, you know, the option to exercise these things or go a different direction as we please. Um, but if there are, if there is a desire to capture something different in the operating procedures, um, we can absolutely do that. Thanks for that clarification. Did you have um, section eight highlighted as well? We do. We can go to the next slide. Section eight talks about amending the operating procedures. <laughs> Megan and I talked about this this morning, and I I, I think not that it's open for interpretation, but it's um, got enough room in it so that in three or four years when it's a whole completely new board, they may want to operate slightly differently and this provides them those parameters to, to change how they operate without going through too much process. So does any member have an interest in rewriting or, or defining some of these terms or sections more strictly? Not hearing it, it sounds like your email and your comments may have solved all of our answers, so thank you. Um, yeah, if there's a further 
comments. Um, you're welcome to email me separately. Um, and we can also bring this up as another uh, meeting topic in the future. If we want to revisit this or any other section of the operating procedures. <laughs> We will now move on to federal facility agreement negotiations. Um, so I unfortunately was not able to get into my email to see which of my, my handy office of council members would be attending tonight. Uh, so we have either Amanda France or Victoria Frankie in the room online. Megan, can you hear me? This is Victoria Frankie. Hi, Victoria. I can hear you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Yeah, to introduce myself, I'm Victoria Frankney. I am Office of Counsel with the Portland District, and I'll be giving you guys an update tonight. Uh, Jeff is not available. Um, as for the federal facility agreement, it has been signed by all parties as of March 25th, so that's great news. Uh, we sent out some letters in, in coordination with EPA uh, inviting the tribes for consultation. Those went out April 3rd. As some of you may recall from our last meeting and just previous update, per the FFA, there is sort of a 15 day period between the execution of the FFA and when that gets posted to the Federal Register. And we kind of extended that slightly to allow more time for tribal consultation. Uh, so we're working on that right now, and then we'll have, uh, we'll be posting that to the Federal Register, which will initiate the 45-day public comment period. Um, and then once all things are considered, after we've closed uh, travel consultation and the public comment period, and considered all comments, uh, that is when the FFA will become effective. Uh, Victoria, I'll ask you to correct me if I misspeak. Um, the tribes will have an opportunity to continuously do, uh, they'll be able to continue to take advantage of tribal consultation after the public comment period starts, uh, but we'll be treating those comments separately from anything we get from the public. Correct, Megan, that is correct. Uh, thank you, Victoria. This is Kate. I just had a quick question. When you said that the letters were sent to the tribes on April 3rd, did, that, did they get a copy of the FFA to review at that time? Is that what they did. Letters? Yeah. Yes, yeah, uh, good question. They did receive the FFA and the uh, included SMPs. I believe those were actually sent ahead of time um, before we even sent the consultation letters just to give them enough time to review it. Okay, great, thank you. And for anyone that doesn't live in acronym world like us in the government do, uh, SMP refers to site management plan. Thank you. I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from um, from the RAB members regarding the federal facility agreement? This is Christy. I, I'm sorry, I've been on here. I don't know if you've heard me or not. Um, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Victoria, can you give me the contact person? Would you send that directly to the chairman of the Nespers tribe? Or does it go to the fisheries department? So I, I'll defer to EPA on that because they were charged with actually circulating those letters. So I am not too confident. I, I cannot speak as to who directly received those letters. Okay, that's what I'm trying to find out is who the point of contact is for through the tribe. Yeah, this is Julie Roble with EPA. I'm sitting in today because both Rich Francis and Lydia Anderson, the RPMs, are... Um, away so i'm stepping in but um i will look you you were asking specifically about nez Perce. yes okay i have the letters i just need to go through all of them and and find that and um i will hop on when i have that and let you okay. know you can email me that'd be fine thank you appreciate that any other questions from round members So this is Kate again. So I understand that Yakima uh, and 
pallets have MOUs? Are there other tribes with MOUs or are they, are there, which are the interested, is there a list of interested tribes that this has been shared with? I guess is my question. Um, is that publicly available or is that? Yeah, uh, the, basically uh, which tribes were contacted for government <laughs> consultation. That's right. Um, you know, I think uh, Julie might be able to help me out with this. Um, the ones I know off the top of my head, Yakima Nation, Warm Springs, Umatilla, Grand Ronde, Nez Perce, Celeste, Cowlitz. Am I missing any, Julie, that you know? No, of? I, I think you got all of them that were on my list. So, yeah, I think there were seven. I believe that's still seven tribes that were contacted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, MOU is a slightly different question. Um, currently, we do only have MOUs with Cowlitz and Yakima Nation, okay. um, and other tribes have been contacted. It's still available for those who would like to uh, develop an MOU with us. Great. And again, a memorandum of understanding. <laughs> I'm guilty too. <laughs> yeah, it's so easy. Um, I'll open it up for any public questions regarding the federal facility agreement. Any uh, in the in the chat, Paige or Kelly? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, thanks, Victoria, for that. Um, we will move on to talking about the core project status. So uh, on the technical side of things, we have now performed uh, two mobilizations underneath the phase one river operable unit work plan or quality assurance project plan. The quality assurance project plan, we are just working to get that into the admin record, and then we will let folks know when that's available. Um, the admin record is publicly viewable, so everyone will have access to that. Um, regarding the field work that's occurring underneath that project plan, we've had two mobilizations at this point. The first one was completed on March 3rd. We took some surface sediment samples around the north and uh, east sides of Bradford Island, as, as well as some that were taken in the Eagle Creek area. Uh, we also deployed some current meters and sediment tracks at that time too. Most of those are along the navigation channel on the south side of Bradford Island and a couple on the north side as well. Uh, after 30 days, those current meters were retrieved. So that information is now being compiled and analyzed. And we checked the sediment traps just to make sure those are operating uh, as expected. Those will remain out in the field until fall of this year. At that point, the sediment traps will be collected and we'll also be deploying some current meters again to get current conditions when the, uh, the spillway is closed. Uh, so yeah, the next mobilization will be in the fall of this year um, and we will continue right along. Um, phase two of the river operable unit, we're still working on the technical approach for that one. Um, <coughs> We have a quality assurance project plan in development currently for the upland operable unit. Uh, once that is that draft is complete, the core will start internal reviews of that. When our internal review is complete and our comments are incorporated, that will go out to states, regulators, and uh, tribes for a review of that product. Uh, once they're review is complete, so all their comments have come in. We've confirmed that their comments have been incorporated appropriately. At that point, we'll bring it to the RAP to present the contents of that. Uh, and then I also want to talk about Cascades Island. There is a draft preliminary assessment that's been provided out to regulators and tribes for their review. Uh, that review is going to be open until May 23rd. Um, barring any requests to extend. And after the review is complete, we'll be presenting that content to the RAP as well. 
Any questions regarding our project status? Which island is Cascade Island? Uh, Cascade Island. Right here, I believe it's the most northern island. Okay. We have a we have a handy dandy map available by any chance. I did not bring one. Yeah, yeah it's Sorry. just north of Bradford Island. Um, I could try to look um, for. Yeah, it's it's on the other side of the spillway. It's basically that spillway is between Bradford Island and Cascades Island. Okay, thank you. It's a lot of islands to keep track of. <laughs> So I was, I was wondering on the phase one and phase two, as far as any numbers, the parts per million, is there any data that we've had for several years to, so when you start taking these that we can actually look back and see, is it the numbers gotten higher, they've gotten lower? Uh, there is uh, some data that's been taken in the past. Um, this is definitely stretching my memory as to what data was taken at what year at this point. Um, but it's uh, the objective of this particular sampling, so especially for, for phase one, um, is not necessarily to compare to past results, um, but to get an understanding of what the nature and extent of the contamination is. What's so there? basically to help define where that offer void unit is and help us set that boundary to understand okay. the area that we need to be looking in. Other questions from round members? Okay, um, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide just to talk a little bit additional project status. Uh, the next slide is regarding our displays. <laughs> so we have now developed three posters uh, that we're planning on putting up in the visitor centers. And those posters are currently being reviewed by our regulators and our tribes. Um, we were hoping to have comments back in time to bring this to this RAB. Um, it just didn't give folks a lot of time. We're actually still getting comments on that. Um, so we're gonna work to get that in front of the RAB in May. Um, but the, the pictures that are shown, this is kind of an example of what these posters might look like. The concept is to have something that's mobile. So that if there are special events going on at the visitor centers, they can, these can be moved. Or over time, if we're finding another location, might be a little more successful in engaging folks. We have that opportunity. And we're also planning to provide copies of Oregon's resident fish advisory. So folks can take those away with them. Those will be available in multiple languages. Yes. Um, did we, I think we, a while back, maybe discuss the option of, of approaching the visitor center to see if we could potentially do duplicate um, displays, like one up by the entrance with the fish advisories, and then again down by the fish viewing. Yeah, in terms of space available, um, that's not an issue. Okay. Um, I I will admit I don't know what. Um, what the cost estimate for these items are. Okay. It would be just kind of a decision of, um, is that, do we feel that double the amount of displays is like uh, worthwhile spending government taxpayer money? Mm -hmm. um, and as we get an idea of like what this looks like, if I, I can't imagine this would be particularly expensive I, that I we would like, yeah. want to kind of really dig our heels in about that, but mm -hmm. it's just something that's always been on my mind as a project manager. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in terms of space, that's not an issue. Great, thank yeah. you. I was wondering, would it be possible or feasible to do, to put some of these signs like at some of the fish and tackle bait store type of things where, because a lot of the guys that go fishing on the river don't go to the Bonneville Dam Viewing Center, but if these signs were like, let's say, Sportsman's Warehouse or Cabela's or something like that, it may draw some more awareness. Or even yeah. some of our fishing stores, you know, just right along Highway 14 or on the Oregon side as well, they make it viewed a little more there than it will. 
because some of the people going through the dam don't live here. So yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, perhaps something we should look into is having developing a smaller mobile version mm -hmm. of some of this information that people would be able to just pick up very easily. Mm -hmm. I think developing like a big standing sign and asking a bait shop, they they might not want to. They might want yeah, not want to humor us. Um, but if we're just uh, able to provide them some flyers and copies of fish advisory, I think that would be a great idea to help. Sportsman's and Cabela's is a fairly large store, mm -hmm. so okay. I think they would have more than adequate room to put up. Yeah, yeah we can definitely look into now. that. We actually we do have uh, orders of uh, organs. Fish advisory that we're going to be printing paper copies of at places like that would be great to um, yeah. provide copies to. We could also look at um, if uh, if they would be willing to you know post some posters for us. Um, mm -hmm. Kelly, could you uh, add an action for the four to look into that, please? Mm -hmm. That's a great suggestion. I think. Yeah. I have one more quick question. Just looking at the dimensions. Um, What's the, do you know what like the total height of these is when they're standing? Um, of these particular ones, I do not. This is definitely just an option for something that we could use. Um, it okay. doesn't have to be a final design. Oh, okay, great. This is just kind of a, yeah. yeah. Um, the intent is to have something mobile. Um, we also want to, uh, another thing that we're kind of considering as we're looking into different designs is um, we know that children come to the visitor center yeah. quite a lot. And so we want to make sure there's something safe for them to be around. Mm -hmm. um, and so anything they can kind of duck and hide or mm -hmm. duck and move through, mm -hmm. we're trying to <clears throat> not have anything like that. Yeah, I was just thinking like the one, some of the ones that are out there, the portable ones at the visitor center were like more like a big panel and I did maybe. My, I was just looking at the dimensions of 22 by 28, and I was thinking the panels probably have a bit more real estate uh, for information. So that's why I was asking about the, the, that aspect of the design. Yeah. Um, another piece that we didn't really talk about on the slide here is while we do know that we are somewhat limited regardless of what format we put into our visitor centers, uh, we'd also like to start developing more information on our website so that we would have a, a QR code on these posters that would direct the public. I do see a question there back to what we're talking about. Um, would it be worthwhile to post informational posters at the boat launches? Yes. Boat launches. Mm -hmm. I think definitely at least the fish advisories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm jumping in. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> we have we have orders for for fish advisories for this very reason, so that we can locate areas that we can post signs. Um, the core already has a couple of fish advisory signs. They're going to be that are going to be replaced. Um, but we're also printing copies for both indoor and outdoor use um, for people to take away with them or to have close on community boards. Cool. So, yeah, we're very open to hearing places that it would be successful in reaching uh, folks who fish in the area or just other local residents who are in this area all the time. Can I ask a question? I'm having a, I'm struggling. This is Jennifer Riddle. Um, yeah. I'm struggling to put my hand up. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. I was wondering, I had a quick question. Are we going to be able to see the posters before they're printed? Absolutely. Awesome. Um, right yes. Now they're, being, they're being reviewed by uh, tribes and by regulators. Once we've been able to incorporate their comments, we're going to provide the draft designs to the RAP for review. Okay. Uh, well, for the voting members and the non-voting members, we'll send those out early before the meeting as we typically send out our uh, our meeting slides. And we'll also have some paper copies in the room for folks to look at. Great. Out of curiosity, are there QR codes on them uh, directing people to the website? Yes, there will be a QR code for the Bradford Island website. There's also one of the posters will be focused on the fish advisory and it will include the QR code for OHA's website about the Bonneville Resident Fish Advisory. Awesome. Thank you.
Um, any other questions regarding the, the visitor center displays, either from RAM members or from public members? Any other comments online? No. Um, and then just the last piece that's on here, we uh, mentioned our community involvement plan. Uh, it's under revision at this time. We are finalizing some responses to comments. We did get some additional comments in just recently. So we're continuing to work on that. Okay. Moving on to the next slide, please. Okay, um, around meeting dates, our next two meetings are May 14th and June 11th. These will both be held as hybrid meetings. We'll be here in the room in Cascade Box, and we'll have a virtual online room. Uh, are there any motions for adding future meetings at this time? What is the typical time? I'm sorry, Pamela, can you say that just a little bit louder? At the time of the meeting, is it typically five o'clock? Oh, yeah, great question. Yes, uh, five o'clock. Typically, the meetings are from five to seven. We can opt to hold shorter meetings if we wish. Um, and of course, there's meetings like this where if we don't have a lot of new things to present or a project plan to present to members, it can go a lot shorter. I think it would be, and maybe this has already been done, but if we could put this kind of calendar up online for folks so that they know, like the public can just get this meeting on the calendar with the Zoom link saying the same kind of things or whatever, however they can act. I'm <laughs> thinking of tonight's <laughs> <laughs> um, But just having that calendar, because I know I get like kind of questions and then reminding people second Tuesday of the month, but it, I think that would be super helpful resource if we just had the you know, a few months out, so then people can just get them on their calendar. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. We have typically been announcing a, a month out mm -hmm. on our website, but we can definitely change formats to list all the meetings that have been established. Cool, yeah, like this is super helpful. Thank you. Um, Kelly, could you, or, or um, Paige, could you take an action for the core to do that? Mm -hmm. And then we can just list any meetings that have been voted on by the RAP to that's great. be scheduled. Um, it looks like we avoid any, at least 4th of July, major holidays with this. Um, I'm fine approving July and August in uh, hybrid meetings, unless there's a desire to go into virtual. But last time there was a, seemed to be a desire to be in person until we kind of get all membership up to speed. I think that makes sense. And for anyone who's having trouble seeing, I know the graphic's a little bit small online. Uh, those meeting dates that are referred to are July 9th and August 13th. Do you want to set a motion for those two? Yeah, um, I will motion to um, approve the next uh, or uh, RAP meeting July 9th um, hybrid and August 14th or 13th hybrid as well. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, great. Motion passes. We will schedule meetings for July 9th and August 13th from 5 to 7 p.m. held as a hybrid meeting. Okay. Um, as before, actually, maybe before we move on to the next slide, um, Jordan asked to request a topic for the next meeting. Yes, so now that we are up to nine members, possibly 10, I'd like to bring up the conversation of a selecting a permanent community co chair. Um, I think that's kind of the goal we set when this interim position was to get to about 10 members. Um, is the membership okay with having that discussion and vote at the main meeting? Yeah. 
We have some information in the operating procedures about some, you know, just some general guidelines about how it can be done. But essentially, um, members are free to nominate someone at the meeting. Um, I believe there's availability to self nominate in yes. the procedures yeah. as well. We may to it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are there any other topics that folks, uh, RAB members have in their mind that they might like to see in the future? I know one that has been requested in the past is to, once the federal facility agreement is, I don't want to say approved, that's not the right word, in effect, uh, that we go through talking about next steps on the project. So that's definitely what we'll have in the future. Um, any other topics that would be desired? Not a topic, but I know there was discussion on setting up um, site visit again. Mm -hmm. Was there any more movement or discussion on that? A little bit of movement, and I actually, I apologize, I need to get back with uh, Christy, Mitch, and Jennifer, and of course I'll reach out to Pamela and Lisa as well. Um, we had been looking at some late April dates. Unfortunately, <clears throat> Bonneville is not able to support those due to high level events that they have going on this time, or during, excuse me, during that time. Um, so I'll reach out to folks about perhaps in early May to mid-May um, site visit. Uh, so basically for kind of family, you haven't been on this, probably not been on the site before. Basically, uh, there's Sunday. I went to the um, and I went to the um, Eagle Creek Lookout site, and then I went around to the end and talked to um, that fell with the that's just a little bit about signage and posting. Right. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so basically, we'll walk around the, uh, the the closed portions of the site. We can show you the different operable areas. I can talk about the history of those, um, what kind of work we're looking to do there, and it'll be a great question just to walk around, get your eyes on what everything looks like, and ask lots of questions. <clears throat> I guess the one thing that might be something that to discuss next time is that I keep getting asked is the possibility of um, off-site contamination, off contamination, other areas that may have left and been dumped at some of the landfills around here hmm. from the original site. Mm -hmm. A lot of people asking about that. Did it all go in the river or how much of it got hauled away and dumped into a landfill? And if there's been any studies done on that or any knowledge of it. Um, so I probably need a colleague to help me out with some of the some of the deeper background work that's been done in the circle process for this project. My understanding of circle process is that um, we start with reviews of um, basically data information that tells us what the history of the site was, the different uses, and records of where things like sediment were placed into different areas. And then we, we follow those. Um, if new information comes to light, we can absolutely continue to follow those information. Um, we do have to start with some actual data. Um, and I, I know sometimes we get a uh, a hearsay or a rumor that may actually be did backed by data, or maybe we can't find anything. Mm -hmm. When we can't find anything, it's a very difficult place to be because yeah. of how the search process works. <clears throat> I know it seemed like in the last meeting or the meeting before last, maybe two meetings ago, something was mentioned about some contamination and it was above the dam on the Oregon side by Eagle Creek or something. Or did I miss it? Are you thinking of Goose Island, maybe? The yeah. side of the where the, the island was made from the when they goose the, island. Yeah. Is it above the dam? It yeah. Is it yes. okay? Then that's it, probably it, yeah. it is up, upstream of the dam. Yeah. Okay. That might have been what. Yeah. Uh, goose Island is actually going to be part of the phase two river operable unit work plans. So there'll be sampling done there. Okay. Um, I did want to real quick uh, clarify because you mentioned Eagle Creek. 
we have done sampling at Eagle Creek, and the intention with that particular sampling is to understand any contamination coming from a different area through Eagle Creek into like those that river area of Bradford. Hey. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe reiterate something I believe I heard Rich Francis say, which was that like in terms of data that would yeah. prompt testing for contamination, like and enough like local uh, input on that, like word of mouth and local knowledge from folks who were around in the area, I think is enough to kind of like trigger an investigation. So it doesn't have to be actual hard data to trigger the investigation. Um, yeah, just wanted to make that clarification. There's a hand up on the Zoom. If you wanna unmute, are you able to unmute? Asa. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Asa Lecky. Um, another possible topic would be the uh, the Cascade Renewable Transmission Project and the impact that might have on sediments downriver. Um, I mean, that's the project that, you know, brought my attention to the RAB board and and what it does. And that's one of the things I would be interested in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Asa. Um, we don't have a lot of information about that project right now. But we can certainly look um, to see if someone could come um, talk to us about that. What I understand currently of the, um, not the design, because I don't think the design has been set at this point, but I believe the uh, concept is to go above ground before Vaudeville, go around, and then come downstream. What I think we don't know at this point is how close that will be to Vaudeville Dam. From what I've read about it, it's coming out of out of the river just west of Stevens and a little bit the old coal line now. Mm -hmm. And then it routes around and then goes back. And I'm not sure where it goes back in the river at. Mm -hmm. But I know that's one of the spots where they've got to yeah. schedule out to come out of. And my understanding is they're also supposed to be working with the states for things like this to um to to be able to uh accommodate concerns such as that as like of moving around the sediment or disturbances in the riverbed. Mm -hmm. A lot of it so it's just speaking to that like unknown nature and extent of the contamination, right? And that's good, a good question to think about as people are yeah. eager to develop. But yeah, we do, we haven't even seen any downstream testing yet. So it's hard to know mm -hmm. like where that boundary is. Any other questions listed online right now or any other hands up? No. No. Okay. Tom Gordon. Does anyone know who Tom Gordon is? Okay. And then we'll yeah. take him out of the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's good. <laughs> no, this is Tom Gordon. Gordon. This is Tom hey, Gordon. Tom, do you have a question? I'm Tom. Um, when you get a chance, can you forward your email to me? Oh, sure. You bet. Or, okay. You know, to Megan and get it to me. Thank you. Okay. That. Uh, one question. What well, I have a couple of questions there. Uh, first is on all your water samples. Is is there going? Are there going to be any tests for nucleotides or nuclear uh, particles coming down from Hanford? Um. Yeah. 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 Um. Let's see. I might uh, ask Julie for a little help on the circle process. I believe our um, what we sample for is based off of records of what was on site before. Basically, like what we what we know of contaminants that were on site before. Okay. Julie, do you have any? Um, yeah. No, that makes sense to me, Megan. Um, I, I think that any sampling, you know, that were to be associated with the Hanford site would be done as part of any Hanford site investigations. I think that's beyond the scope of, you know, what we have planned uh, for this project. Um, okay. You know, the idea, the idea is to start with the sources that we know about 
um, at Bradford Island, you know, investigate those. But but the site ultimately is defined by where contamination comes to be located. So, you know, contamination that's spread in other areas, we do we do eventually want to understand like that scope of the site and the site management plan um, that's attached to the FFA does talk about that. Okay, thank you. And then second question, when is the FFA going to be uh, available so the public can look at it? And then I think you said the comment period goes until May 21st. Um, so let's see, the federal facility agreement, uh, Julie, do you know the exact date that uh, it should be put in the federal registry? You know, I know unfortunately, I, I think it slipped because those um, tribal, I'm, I'm glad this calendar is up. I think because the tribal letters were sent out a few days later than expected, it'll probably be posted like the first few days in May. I don't have the exact exact date um, because it did slide a little bit. I know at one time we were thinking it was going to be April 29th, but I think it's going to be a few days later than that. So, so definitely like that very first part of May, it should get published. Um, and at that time, you know, I assume we could send it out to this group for distribution. Um, hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn there. Okay, great, thank you. And also- uh, uh, No, oh, as I say, I was gonna jump in, Julie, that's correct. We we had talked with uh, Laura from EPA that once EPA sends it out, that it's out for public release, we would also do our due diligence to send it out to um, the folks that are on this notification list. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, that was my understanding. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, I can give you our email address right now, or Kate has our email address. I, I'll give it to her, Tom. I'll take care of it. Thank, okay. thank you, Kate. Thank you. Yeah, any, anyone who would like to be added to the email address, um, you're welcome to either pop your email address into the comments if you're comfortable with that. We also have a public comment box listed at the very bottom left of this slide. Uh, you can contact that and let us know that you'd like to be included on any information about the round. Thank you. I mean, at this point, we kind of slipped into our public open forum. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm happy to continue rolling with that. Are there any other questions or comments from the public? Okay, I'm not hearing any, not seeing any online. Um, just a final around for the, uh, any RAB members, any additional uh, topics that you would like to discuss today? Not hearing any around the room, not seeing any online. Okay. Uh, at that point, we are now at the end of our agenda. Is there a motion to conclude the meeting? A motion to adjourn. And is there a second? A second. Seconded. And uh, I believe we don't want to vote on this. So thank you all <laughs> so much for your time. Thanks on, again online folks for, for hanging in there with a troll in the room. Apologies for that. Um, hopefully it is a one time. Um, but we really appreciate the folks that do attend in earnest and participate in these conversations. Uh, we're really happy you're here. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you next time on May 14th.